welcome back. We saw some very simple examples of code demos for neural networks in the last uh, couple of videos. What we are going to do is do an actual full code demo of a physics informed neural network, just as I had described last week. This is taken directly from MATLAB's examples. So MATLAB has a PD toolbox, which is available to you during the duration of this course, in case you have taken this course for credit. Of course, uh, the original paper from which this is, is the Raisi and Karniadakis paper that uh, I had referred to in the last week. So this is the 2019 paper. So these people have, uh, these researchers have given their direct code on TensorFlow. The code is, uh, the code repository, etc., are downloadable from their website. This is, of course, a Python code. Okay. But I'm going to show the demo since we have been using MATLAB throughout. I'll just simply show some salient points of this code. Now, I have mentioned that this is for Berger's equation. So Berger's equation, uh, is a PDE. The PDE is like this, del u del t plus u del u del x. So this is a nonlinear equation. This term being nonlinear is equal to some constant times u x x. Those of you who know the Navier-Stokes equation, which you should since you are taking this course as inverse methods in heat transfer, would know that this is known as some coefficient of viscosity. Or kinematic coefficient, uh, kinematic viscosity. In this case, this is sort of a pseudo coefficient. It's uh, in case u represents velocity, its units are meter square per second. This basically tells you uh, what the viscous or the diffusion term is in this equation. Now, typically, Berger's equation, even if you start smooth, can actually lead to, so even if you start with an initial condition like this, it can sharpen and become shocks, which is why it is sort of a, a good example for Navier-Stokes, especially compressible Navier-Stokes equations. So I am taking an example, like I said, with some initial conditions that look like this, which is directly right out of the paper. So this is the initial condition. So when you write the initial condition, you would write u of x for t equal to 0 is some function, let's say sine of pi x. I'll show you the exact function the researchers used and indeed what we'll be using for our code here. So similarly, we will use some specific value of mu, which the researchers used, but that's not sufficient. So if we simply say that u of x0 is given. We want the solution in time. Okay, so this is time. So you need some boundary condition here as well. So you can use periodic boundary conditions or fixed boundary conditions. A lot of possibilities exist. I'll show you the choice that the researchers made once again. Now, these points here are the initial condition points. As I told you during our pin discussions, these can be fairly arbitrary, unlike when we use a finite difference or a finite volume solution. Now, these green points are the boundary condition points. These red points are the initial condition points. But that's not sufficient. We need a lot of PDE points. So what does this mean? It means that you want to satisfy all these three in a least square sense. So let's say we arbitrarily put some points and we call these PDE points. So what's the idea? We simply say u, I know is a function of x and t. Instead of that, I represent this diagrammatically as x, t, and a neural network. Now, this is not one single hidden layer, but here is my output, u or u hat. So we are going to take, if I remember right, I'll show you this in the code. We are going to take about nine layers. So you're going to have nine hidden layers here. 
and each one is going to have around 20 neurons. Okay, so this is what means. So we have 20 neurons each or 20 to 25 neurons in each one of these layers. All this means is U hat is a fairly complex function which has a whole bunch of uh, basically unknowns or a whole bunch of parameters. How many? So you can see that every two layers we are going to have approximately 400, 400 plus 400 multiplied by 8. So you are going to have approximately 3000 parameters. This is very few parameters, honestly, for a typical large neural network, not for a pin network, but for a large neural network, these number of parameters are not very large. So this is actually a reasonably sized uh, neural network, just with 20 neurons each with nine layers. Okay, so once we have these, what happens? So you forward propagate through this for some given set of parameters. You should remember this from our, so for a guess of W, you forward propagate, you get U hat, but not only do you get U hat, you can actually estimate del U hat del T, del U hat del X. You can also estimate del square U hat del X square. How do we do that? Once I know the function U, obviously I can find out what del U del T, del U del X, del square U del X square are. And the trick to this is to use autograd or automatic differentiation. And uh, automatically, this is basically a, just like we achieve del uh, uh, j at del w, you can achieve del u hat del x by a simple calculation through backprop. Okay. But this backprop has a different purpose from the backprop that we usually use in neural networks. That's to update the weights. This is simply to calculate what these terms are. So once you do this, then you have loss terms. So loss PDE, of course, is at every PDE point, you go here and calculate these three terms and see, does, I'm going to call this for simplicity's sake, ut, ux, and uxx. So I'm going to simply check is ut plus uux, Is this term zero or not? Typically, obviously, since we are randomly guessing at this point, it's not going to be zero. So you square this. Now, at the BC points, you go and check at the BC points. You check is U satisfying whatever the U boundary condition is. Similarly, at the initial condition points, you check is U satisfying the whatever my initial condition set, and we obviously have to square these. Okay. Then we can say that the total loss is, let's call it L total is LPDE plus LBC plus LIC. So this is the loss. Then you find out del L del W. Okay. Calculate that, then W is W minus alpha times del L W, del del W. Uh, the code that I'm going to show used a slightly different optimization scheme. It's still based on gradient descent, but it uses something called Adam. Adam is simply a different optimization scheme. Okay. So Adam is a optimization scheme that's a variant of gradient descent. Okay. So I'll now show you the code and you can see the results uh, within MATLAB. So if you wait for a few seconds, I'll show you the code. So this is uh, the example code which exists. Uh, so I'm not going to share this code online. You can basically go to MATLAB and uh, look for uh, this, this particular example, which is called the Train Physics Informed Neural Networks. Uh, example. So uh, I would request you to search there. Again, this will be available only during the duration of the course. The purpose of this code, of course, is to show you how such codes look in practice. So let's look at this. We have these three things. We have the PDE, which will bring us the PDE loss. 
uh, you can see ut plus uux equal to this term minus uh, 0 0.01 by pi. This is new. 0 0.01 by pi is just the uh, viscosity coefficient. Now, you can see that the initial condition was not sine pi x as I had said, but it was negative sine pi x just to get a particular waveform which goes positive and then goes negative uh, as x becomes uh, positive here. Okay. Now, the boundary condition you can see here is that on the left and on the right, they have basically ensured that the velocity stays zero if u is the velocity. Okay. So, you can see that we train the model by for a given input xt, uh, if it lies at the boundary, you try to satisfy the boundary condition. If it lies at the initial condition, you try to satisfy the initial condition and everywhere else you basically satisfy the PD. You do not require to collect data in advance. This, this is an important point. Okay, So you do not require to collect data in advance basically because the data is this. The only other data you need is these points, initial and initial and boundary conditions. But otherwise, you have PDE data because you know the PDE is satisfied at every single point in the domain. So even though this says generating uh, generate training data, all we are doing is collecting a set of points where we are going to impose the PDE. Okay, so you see that uh, the boundary conditions at left and at the right, the green points that I showed you earlier in the video. These are enforced by keeping 25 equally spaced points on the left and uh, on the right. Okay, so now they are just collecting these. Uh, this is the left boundary condition. This is the right boundary condition. Uh, similarly, these are the temporal boundary conditions. Temporal boundary conditions meaning initial condition and the final condition. I didn't draw this. This is at the top. Just like I had some condition at the bottom, they have put some other condition at the top. Okay, so the left BC is set to be zero because that's what it is set to be here. That's why this says U zero BC equal to zeros. And similarly, on the right also you have zeros. So rest of it are just MATLAB details that I will leave to. Initial conditions are 50 points as I said here. So you can see this and the initial conditions are now set to minus sine pi of x. Okay, so 50 points here, 25 points each on the left and on the right. Okay, so this now has been set. Now, these points are basically the PDE points that I talked about. Okay, so these are the PDE points. Those randomly strewn white points that I had shown in the video earlier are basically these uh, PDE points. And these are 10,000 points that are put in the entire domain. Okay, so... Uh, we have just randomly chosen, there is something called a Sobel set, uh, we don't care about that. So once we put that, we have got a whole bunch of points now. So DS is the data set, which is the bunch of points where you are going to impose. These are the X's and T's where, where we are going to impose the PD. So now here it is, as I said, uh, I seem to have remembered correctly. We have nine fully connected operations with, around, with 20 hidden neurons. Each. So this will be 3000 plus uh, parameters. Okay, so you have X and T at the input and uh, you have just one single output on the outside, which is U. Okay. So here you have number of layers is nine, number of neurons is 20. So I'm going to skip this because now you can see weights, biases, etc. Defined here, there is a certain type of initialization so these are random initializations that we are giving for weights called K initialization. Okay. Um, this exactly is just a neural network definition. Now, when I showed you the XOR example, I was going step by step. And I think I, I hope at least that that was more readable than this. But if, if you know MATLAB or indeed, if you go to uh, Python and use one of these frameworks, you will see that that's uh, reasonably understandable once you actually go ahead and uh, implement uh, a few codes. Okay, so here is simply some detail that shows you that a lot of fully connected layers are there and you have lots of weights in the middle. Okay, so now uh, here is a model. So you have a model function, you have a model loss function. Notice here, 
the model loss function is simply uh, this MSEF means the same as what I called LPD, the PDE loss, and MSEU is basically all the terms of this sort, where you have error from uh, the boundary condition or the initial condition, or if you have some data points also in the middle, you can add those as well. And here are, of course, the uh, PDE loss uh, functions. So you can see here, uh, this is basically assuming some parameters are known. So parameters here are just the Ws. So for a given X and T, you can do a forward prop and that gives you U. That's what used to be our Y hat. You can also calculate gradients. Okay, So uh, basically ignore all this term, but basically you can calculate gradients. You can calculate X gradient. You can calculate T gradient and you can also calculate the second gradient, you know, uxx. And here it is. Here is our simple loss. Our simple loss is ut plus uux minus mu times uxx. This should be square and that sits in here. Okay, we, we say that it has to be squared by saying mse. Similarly, initial and boundary conditions are put together and predicted here in just the single term loss u. And we say that collect all these at all these points x0, t0, which puts together all the points, the initial condition, boundary condition, all those points, and simply says, whatever prediction you made here, compare it with what I wanted the value to be, and just add the mean square error, and that will see the loss. And at this point, you basically calculate the gradient. This here is the forward model. Instead of using a sigmoid, you can see that they have used a tan edge and that it is a fully connected layer in in middle of every tan edge tan edge as i had told you in the nonlinearity chapter in the uh, last week uh, that tan edge tends to work better than sigmoid a tan edge works better because its derivative at 0 is 1 whereas the sigmoid derivative is 0. Uh, 0.25 and that tends to work worse as you go through multiple layers I had also told you that ReLU works even better, but the reason we did not use ReLU here is this term. Uh, the term uxx, uh, since ReLU is a linear function, uxx will always turn to zero. So if you have a uxx term, you can't use ReLU within physics-informed neural networks because we want the second derivative to be non-zero. Obviously, uh, if we give a model which doesn't give a second derivative at all, you are going to get uh, uxx is 0 by default everywhere. So once you do this, you have just a simple step here. You can see this number of epochs, etc. You give, you. they also have a more fancy way of running this where the learning rate is actually updated. This is another variant of uh, um, gradient descent. And you can see this term saying Adam update. So as I had told you, this is a variant once again of gradient descent. Adam is an optimization. So you can see an Adam solver, etc. All the other terms are just in order to make this whole thing run. Okay. Uh, and once we do that, you can just like the last time when we checked y versus y hat, you can now evaluate model accuracy if it runs fully. So what I will show you now is uh, we won't have the time to go through the full run. Obviously, this takes time. The references are given here at the bottom. Okay, So this is the first paper is the Raisi and uh, Karniadakis paper. Uh, Bardi Karras is another uh, professor at uh, Penn State uh, who works a lot on um, physics and form neural networks. So let me just run this quickly. And I want to show you just how this proceeds. We can't show you the end. I will show you the end result on uh, the MATLAB website. So hopefully this, we see some results here. So yes, you can now see the number of epochs and you can see it updating. Okay, So you can see that the loss updates itself and generally tends to go down. You will see some spike ups sometime in the middle. So as the loss goes down, uh, this is why we typically plot the loss versus the number of iterations, just to see that the whole thing is behaving as expected. 
So once the loss comes to one standard value, we say that the loss has saturated. So we have now about uh, 75, 76 iterations here. I will right now stop it and show you the results on a um, different thing where on, on MATLAB's official uh, website. So you can go to this website uh, written here. If you go to the deep learning toolbox and then look at solve partial differential equations using deep learning, this is actually available within MATLAB's website. If you say open in MATLAB online and uh, during, in case you're taking this course for credit, uh, during the course of this uh, or during the course of being enrolled in this uh, NPTEL course, you will be able to open this in MATLAB and actually run it and you can check how it works. So the same code here, I just want to show you the final results. You can see here that uh, this ran for 3000 epochs because that was what uh, the number of epochs was defined to be. You can see here number of epochs is 3000. Uh, yeah, this is important. Uh, I had not mentioned it while showing you the code earlier that the mini batch size is 1000. Now, what does mini batch size mean? Uh, remember that we had a mini batch gradient descent, batch gradient descent, and gradient descent. So we had 10,000 points here but only 1,000 of them will be taken each time for updating the loss function. That's what mini batch size of 1,000 means here. Okay, so we run that and you can see that after some time, the loss basically uh, gets approximately to zero, at least in comparison to the original thing. You can see loss is 10 power minus five. Okay, so you can also see the final predictions. The red lines here are the actual ground truth, which we never looked at, by the way. Please remember that in this case, the way PIN works, we never actually looked at the ground truth, the red truth, because we were only looking at the derivative. So that's the clever part. We did not impose ground truth on you, but ground truth on derivatives of you. So we found out the, uh, the relationship between derivatives of you. You can see that the prediction is uh, pretty good. So, in this video, you basically saw uh, that pins can work pretty well even on a seemingly reasonably complex problem, provided you give sufficient data and uh, you give sufficient compute on this data. So, I'll see you in the next video. Okay.